Hello, everybody. How are you for this week's installment of Q Classes? I appreciate you all coming. Um, today, we are um, very happy to have our one of our newest faculty, or not newest, I guess we're, it's actually somebody new this year, but as of Old last, now, yes. Old now, is uh, Professor Mark Powell. Um, Mark has, is the head of orchestral studies at Aaron Copeland School of Music. And I'm really excited about this because I feel um, it is an interesting time to be thinking about um, exactly the topic. And the topic is, are you an artist? Resilience, rehearsal, and staying in the zone. Which is interesting because I think um, just to talk about, uh, you know, being an artist, I, I've been thinking about that a lot. There's a lot of stuff going on in the news. There's COVID-19. I've been thinking about it as a director and as a performer, playing a couple of concerts over Zoom. And what does it mean? And what does it mean? And maybe the lasting effect of this. So with that, I'd like to introduce uh, a new friend and a fantastic conductor and colleague, Professor Mark Powell. Thanks, Michael. I'm delighted to be here. Thanks for asking. Um, this, the invitation to come and talk about all of this stuff sort of made me think that um, I could distill some things that leak into rehearsal at various times without having to run a rehearsal. So we could actually make some of these ideas go from the beginning to the middle to the end and make them a subject of, of conversation. So thank you for the invitation and I'm looking forward to it. Um, the, the title of Are You an Artist? does something that uh, publishers are really happy about. They love like provocative titles to get people to go, oh, I have to go to that Zoom meeting or, oh, I need to check into that Facebook live feed. I like it because it's a scalable question. Um, are you giving an artistic response to your daily practice, what you're hearing, uh, what you're contributing in a situation? It's a super scalable question because our, our goals include being musical artists. That's a really humongous goal, but it's a goal that you get to build step by step by step. And just by asking the same question in a variety of different sizes of situations, you can stay on track, which I think is really hugely important. So the, the reason that I started off with that is being resilient, staying in a zone when you're performing or, or practicing. And this question of, are you an artist? Really come together very, very well in a complete approach. Uh, when I'm teaching one-to-one, -one, whether it's a conducting student uh, or clarinet student or coaching music history or theory or whatever it is we're working on, but especially the applied stuff, when I ask for an artistic response, or I ask somebody if they're giving an artistic response, and you can do this too when you're teaching, it is a phenomenal way to get information from the person you're teaching about how they think about their practice. All of us at one time or another in personal practice have drilled in on a detail so minute for such a, a concentrated period of time that we've obsessed on a particular thing. It could be the onset of a particular kind of articulation. It could be getting a dynamic perfectly right within a phrase. Uh, it could be making sure that the bow comes off of the string with just enough energy so that the articulation is perfect or hitting the right part of a, a timpani head to, to give you the sound that you really want. Really fantastic musicians, once they've drilled down to that level of detail, can stay there long enough to play around with the mechanics that got you there. It's not just, oh, that's what I want, and now I can move on. It's the ability to cultivate patience within yourself so that you can move your tongue around and decide, oh, that articulation is a little bright. I'm going to save that for this or I can make this articulation sound a little darker by maybe changing some mechanics. I can hit a different part of the timpani head. I can use a softer mallet or a harder mallet. 
Uh, I can change the way I address my instrument. And getting, getting lost in that level of detail and being able to concentrate on it to the exclusion of everything else is an incredibly valuable part of being a musician. And that's where resilience starts. So anyway, that's where the title came from. That's the first point. And just wanted to say that before we started. It, it is interesting, actually. I'll just relay the quickest story. Actually, it was very interesting. As a teacher, I brought one time, I used to do many years ago as an adjunct, actually, I used to bring some friends in to do master classes. And Tara O'Connor, Tara Helen O'Connor, for those who don't know, almost on faculty, married to faculty right now, used to be on faculty, but a great flutist, probably, you know, I think one of the best around. Um, and um, she was coaching some like oboe, clarinet, contemporary duet or something like that. And it was so cool. She was like reading the line on the flute. And, you know, I've known her a while. And I was just kind of like watching her because I, I dig watching people teach. And she was like working like the exact angle to try not just to get the right sound, but try to sound like a clarinet. Weirdly, you know what I mean? Like, and I just found that like you're saying a deep dive, you know, I am curious, like for you yourself conducting, you know, how do you relay the information to a timpanist to try and sound more like a harp or a pizzicato or like, you know, that's an interesting thought as far as a teacher and as a player, right? I mean, a player has to be able yeah. to interpret that quickly. I don't know, any thoughts on Absolutely. that? Absolutely. What I have found works really well just for me because you absolutely can take that too far. We have all been in rehearsals where the conductor says, I would like this to sound like a butterscotch sunrise over a lemonade lake. And that's when you look at your stand partner and go, what in the hell is this person talking about? The ability to, to illustrate a texture either by demonstrating it or finding really direct applicable language. Can I have a darker sound? Can I have a sound that speaks right away? Uh, can you produce a sound that starts with no articulation at all, but that just comes out of, out of nowhere? For a conductor, the ability to talk about that quickly and directly and appropriately uh, saves time in a rehearsal, obviously, because there's never enough time to rehearse. But it also keeps that communication loop between you and whoever you're working with really, really tight and really fast. And the ability to hear something right away and react to it, either to you know, make a better ensemble sound or, or make the musical phrase more intense or achieve some kind of a goal, speaks to the end of our talk, which is staying in the zone. The faster that you can hear something and deliver a fluid response that addresses it immediately, that's what you're after as an ensemble musician. And that's what you're after in, in really any uh, rehearsal in which you find yourself and even just daily practice when, when you are on your own. All of us in, in one guise or another can obsess on something to the point of it being absolutely unhealthy. I am absolutely going to get this bow arm if it kills me. Well, if you do it too much, it will kill you. Um, you know, repetitive stress injuries are things we have to guard against. So the variety with which you can address how to get a particular sound just with yourself is worth your spending time with it to describe it and then try to fit language around it so you can describe it to somebody else. Uh, all of us, and, and for, for all of you who are, who are studying at any level, undergrad, grad, pro, doesn't matter. When you demonstrate for someone else the sound that you'd like them to internalize and, and imitate and deliver back to you, you've gotta be able to approach that result quite a few different ways if you're going to make contact with somebody and get them to play a certain way. And one of the only, I'm not going to say the only, but a really effective way that I have found for you to do that is to play with the skill in your own way, in your own practice. So once you've gotten that perfect timpani hit, like this is exactly how that Mahler 6 sound should happen. And you've done that Stay patient and stay in it long enough so that once you're satisfied, you can still play around with it. You don't leave it and go, yeah, I can do that. 
because when it comes to being able to deliver that thing that you just practiced to make really fantastic, you have to be able to deliver that in any possible condition. A cold concert hall, a noisy practice room, uh, maybe your dogs are barking outside your practice room, doesn't matter. But you have to be able to reproduce in a variety of situations the thing that you work on. And that's, that's building resilience. That's building resilience as a player. And you can spin out that resilience in a variety of ways to keep yourself healthy. You know, um, just to go a little more, I guess I'm asking a question that's a little bit further on in your discussion, but um, for the first part, um, you know, okay. we were talking about like an art, you were, you were beforehand, Mark and I were talking about what this class is. And we were talking about like an artistic response to situations. So maybe, um, you know, what is that? What does that really mean? It's something I think we all struggle with, right? There's that Toni Morrison quote about, you know, now is the time for us as artists to kind of speak, you know, so. Absolutely. The way that I think about it and the way that I teach it, regardless whether it's a conductor or an ensemble or a one-to-one -one clarinet lesson or whatever, an artistic response is a response to information that you get that makes the situation you are in better by your participation. If you have a solo in an ensemble texture, it's participating to the degree that that solo adds something to the artistic whole of that performance. If you're in a personal interaction, your ability to listen to what somebody is saying and add to that conversation in a healthy or supportive way so that your participation elevates the interaction that's what an artist does. We have, all of us, stood in front of, whether it's a painting or a piece of sculpture and gone, what? My kid could do that. And then you go into the next gallery. One of the beauties of that or, or poetry or prose is that if you don't get that artistic statement, you can go into the next room. You can put the book down. You can come back to it. And that sculpture or that painting or that prose passage or that, that poetic passage is still there on the page. It's still in front of you, ready for you to address it. And we as musicians can't do that in a live performance. You just get the one shot. And so for us, that, that artistic moment to make a musical gesture count is the result of serious thought, a lot of planning, a boatload of experimentation, and the cooperation of the people in the ensemble. An, an artistic life is lots of those moments piled one on top of the other. And an artistic response for me is a response that takes in the information around me. I process that information through my own experience and whatever I decide to add to that situation, be it a conversation or a piece of writing or a conference or a rehearsal or a performance is filtered through my experience so that whatever I contribute can make that situation better. That's why we look to artists to do a really thorough and amazing job. It's why the artists that you know whom you revere as supremely gifted artists have the, the footprint in your mind of being great. It's because they've done something with their resources to make an impression on you. And whether it was an opera role or a phenomenal concerto performance, maybe it's a piece of sculpture, maybe it is a piece of poetry, but the term artist in your brain as it exists has happened because something has touched you at a very deep level. Uh, Frank Morelli, when he was speaking about uh, other tools to get through this time and to stay focused and positive and centered, spoke a little bit about the, the spiritual aspect of hopefulness and optimism. And I look at, hope to, uh, at optimism and hope, optimism, I don't know, we could, we could invent that, um, as the end result 
of an artistic response, of the deliberate goal of an artistic response. I think those are just really natural consequences. You were mentioning about um, uh, resilience. In, like maybe I'm, I'm a little, uh, I don't really, you know, I'm, I'm trying to understand what you mean by that. Maybe you can go in a little deeper dive on that. Yes, absolutely. So resilience for me is also the, it's the end result of a process and it's a way to go about the intermediate steps to get to that process. And resilience too is totally scalable. Uh, at some point in our lives, we have to deal with the really sort of horrific, colossal consequences of losing someone we love. Um, and we have to deal with the teeny consequences of, I'm sorry, we don't have that ground of coffee today. We're going to have to give you this. And so the difference between that sort of Mount Everest of, of change and this little disappointment play on your resilience, whether or not you can survive the death of a loved one or whether or not you get pissed off or not that your coffee isn't there is the end result of whether or not you're personally resilient. And we as musicians, because of the way we work absolutely every day, we foster resilience by healthy practice. You are never gonna sit down at your instrument. You are never going to be in a practice room with your voice warmed up and ready to go and have it go well all the time. Otherwise, everybody would be doing this and it would be boring. Your ability when things do not go well to stay focused and centered on a goal is the end result of how resilient you are. If you are taken off track, if you are kicked off, off the track really easily and very easily disappointed by the absolute smallest thing or a medium sized thing or a colossal thing, if all three of those things, those different things kick you off of your goal or off of your track to the same degree, it's time to work on being more resilient. And I say that musicians have an advantage there because if you're not resilient, you're gonna make the same mistake every single practice session. And effective practice for us means making a different mistake and then not making that same mistake again in the same way. And then the absence of the mistake and then the same material getting better. And then that same material becoming a strength. And this works anywhere. If you can't accurately sing an ascending, an, an ascending major sixth, which by the way is hard, even for singers, then you work on it until it's a strength. You are going to absolutely suck at any new skill that requires work, patience, or time. And if you accept that ahead of time and, and acknowledge that, you are 50 steps ahead of the amateur, the dilettante, or the lazy person. That's hugely important. And I will say that again. If you can maintain patience to really suck at something while you start at it and make it better, you automatically put yourself into the minority of people who are going to be able to do that better and faster and finally get to a positive result. Resilience is bound up in that because the being awful at something uh, that you eventually fix and make better, if you can pull the misery out of that step and go, I can't double tongue, what oboist can double tongue? This is, this is insane. It sounds like a sick duck. It's right. fine. Drop it and go back to practicing double tonguing. It's a deliberate effort to take the negativity and the, I have to climb Mount Everest and I only have a pair of tennis shoes argument out of being able to do something. If you can remove the angst from doing something, you're gonna get better at it faster. You're gonna get better at it faster than other people. And you're gonna put yourself in that four or 5% of people for whom doing the hard thing is an advantage and a strength rather than something, oh, there's no way in the world I could possibly do that. No way. Um, 
I had, we'll, we'll stay with uh, an anecdote uh, from fairly recent times. I had somebody who was actually in my office at the Copeland School. And it was someone who's a very experienced choral conductor who's out working with a, a community choir and who wants to do more orchestra work. And this woman was speaking with me. She said, I'm, I'm too old for this. And I didn't say anything. I just pointed to my Eastman doctoral diploma on the wall. And I said, see that piece of paper up there? I went and got that when I was 49 years old and her jaw hit the floor. It's like, you, well, really? So the, the, the more you can bring to a situation in which the difficult or the time consuming or the really hard thing doesn't stir up angst in you, the faster you're gonna get better at it. That's a really useful thing when you have to tear down technique and rebuild it in a healthy way. It's interesting, uh, as you know, f for the students, yeah, I guess even for the faculty here too, I was thinking while you were saying, you know, um, that risk of making a mistake, you know, as a student, I mean, you spend your life with a teacher telling you you can't do, or not that you can't do something, but oh, no, you did it wrong. Like really, yeah. we just did it wrong. We do it wrong all the time in order to be able to somehow manage to get the courage to do it right later on on our own. But it is nice, you know, for faculty and students that, if they're fostering that relationship uh, with others for that support. You know, one of the best moments I ever had musically, which really kind of changed my life was in a group that I play with uh, regularly, a percussionist, and they're just great guys and they're my family. We've been playing together for 28 years. But there was one moment, it was just, you know, we were all on each other's back and stuff about things and we got done with the rehearsal and one of the guys just turned to the others and was like, you know, you really played well today, you know, to another person. It wasn't to me, you know, but it was to another person. And, and, um, and that started a thing where um, we would always do that. And, it, 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 you know, and then we were adults. We were, I was in, you know, that was my yeah, yeah. 30s. But, but it was a nice feeling of that. And I, I wish I thought of that more when I was a student, like that kind of like safe space of doing that. Like you're saying, and the saying, like, you know, to clown my, Mount Emrys in a, pair of tennis shoes, but wouldn't it be nice if there were seven of you doing it together kind of thing, you know what I mean? So, yeah. yeah. Uh, yeah. You, you, I love the fact that you use the word courage because that is bound up in this approach. Uh, it, it takes courage to be awful at something long enough to polish it and make it better. Uh, and that too is something that musicians are really, really good at. Uh, I, rem I, I gave a, a workshop not too long ago in which there was an accountant and a conductor and an applied teacher and an attorney. And I think there was a nonprofit president. There were a couple of board members present. And so I, I gave them this group task to do. And it was the attorney, the person whose life is speaking in front of courts of law who stepped forward and said, I'm, I'm really not very good at this. And I just want you to know that if, if, if it doesn't go well, it's just because I, I, I don't like speaking in front of people. Huh. And everybody in that room went, this is the litigator who's saying this. Right, right. But just because the environment was different and there was a conductor musician leading this workshop and all these different sorts of people around, they exempted themselves from their profession. And that, that lack of connection and courage can hit any of us. And as long as you stay patient with yourself, positive, and maintain some courage, you don't have to worry about that. But I love the fact that you said courage, because that is a huge element. That's, in, that's an enormous part of being able to pay attention long enough to be resilient and to move forward. It's funny, just on a side note, sorry, everybody, I'm talking too much, but uh, I was listening oh, to, an, uh, to a, a, an interview with Metallica, the rock band, and they played with the San Francisco Symphony. And the first go around, I guess it was 20 years ago, there's some kind of album coming out. And they were saying the first go around, it's just about this. They were saying how intimidated they were 
like here's like a band that grossed 1.2 billion and that is with a b billion dollars last year you know and they were saying they were just so intimidated working with this orchestra and they didn't know how to do it and they wanted to jam with the orchestra and the orchestra was like uh -huh. you know and then they went back and did it with michael tilson thomas i guess a little later and that's what they're the tour or the album they're putting out now or something and they were just saying that it was like you know just funny to think like here's these you know rock i guess like legends and taught working with an orchestra and i'm sure the orchestra musicians were exactly the same thing and and the second time around when they all felt they were talking about like courage they were saying like oh you know like I, I felt uncomfortable asking for something and michael tilson thomas was like well i felt uncomfortable asking you like I, I don't want to destroy your vision and you know and then the second time around there was like more of like this go between between the two and a, i haven't heard the album I'm sure it's wonderful but um you know uh, it's just an interesting you know collaboration of sorts um there's a know, really here's and i'm i'm speaking to the orchestral musicians yeah. in the audience and people listening on facebook if you want to go explore something really cool, there's an MSNBC host named Ari Melber. He yeah. is an attorney by trade and a news commentator by practice. But all of his Instagram live feeds are interviewing hip hop, rap, and R&B artists. And those interviews are freaking brilliant. Um, and, and that is not a part of the concert world that I knew much about at all before four years ago. So just the fact that I, I was interested enough to go, well, the, you know, Ari Melber's not an idiot. He probably has some really interesting questions. And through that, meeting other uh, journalists and other artists in that area, the, the idea that the pudgy, bald, middle-aged white guy who conducts the orchestra at Copeland School and works with the opera orchestra and the studio orchestra and the chamber orchestra has an interest in Ari Melber talking to an incredibly wide range of artists from another field. When I've mentioned that to other people, I go, really? What's that? And then I get to talk about other stuff, which is cool. But I, I really like the fact that you said courage because courage is is part and parcel of being any kind of a musician, uh, amateur, professional, beginner, intermediate, advanced, whatever. All of that involves a degree of courage. You can, all of you, think back to an early important performance and either being petrified or going, I really want to do this. This is going to be great. Or some portion of something in between those two emotions or on either side of those two emotions. The reason you were nervous about it is because you cared about it. And so being acutely aware of the care you want to give a performance, yeah, you're going to be nervous. You're going to be petrified in some instances. And it takes courage to push that to the side or just to let it fall away and go and do a really great job. So thank you for using that word. No problem, no problem. I agree. I think sometimes musicians, we, we don't realize the power that we have actually. We underestimate, you know, some of the greatest memories everybody has is probably based around some kind of music or piece of art, so. Um, you know, you and I talked, uh, could you explain to you of these thoughts about what you call close listening? Yes, absolutely. Um, I had a chance to talk to John Cleese, actually, two weeks ago, the Monty Python guy. Wow. He was professor at large at Cornell uh, for about six years, and he lectured on absolutely everything from script writing to directing to slapstick humor to acting. And I asked him specifically about acting. And in the limited time that we had together, his, his advice for someone who is studying acting seriously is to find a, a piece of writing, find a monologue, find something small that really moves you, that brings you to tears or that makes you incredibly happy and repeat it, memorize it, internalize it until that effect goes away, until you are no longer viscerally affected by the thing 
in the course of study. And then you can start to take it apart. Now, that's threatening for a non-artist because a non-artist is going to look at that and go, oh, the magic has gone out of that piece of writing for you, or oh, the music is no longer special. Bull doo doo. Um, the ability to understand something at a very, very deep, detailed level for us as musicians is the end result of close listening. Now, what I mean by that is this. Um, I'll, I'll put it in the context of a lesson first. Uh, not too long ago, just a few minutes, we were talking about the onset of an articulation and, and experimenting with it until it's just right, whether it's bow speed or bow pressure or moving your tongue back or giving your, your embouchure more resonant space or moving the timpani stick, whatever. The way that you become acquainted with the result you want is to listen to something to the same degree of detail. And that means repetitive listening. Um, and I, I, I don't mean that you should take like the same three pieces and just listen to those for four days until they're ringing through your brain and you hate them again. Um, it means taking apart maybe the first movement of a symphony you really, really love and doing something else while you're listening to it so that you're both passively listening to it and then actively listening to it. If, if you're in my conducting studio, I'm gonna give you a piece that you have absolutely never heard before, and I'm gonna hold the score for the first two weeks. I'm not gonna let you look at the score. I'm gonna give you the new piece so that it is just an aural experience. And for the first week, I'm gonna ask you to listen to that piece two or three times a day actively. And by actively, I mean you are doing nothing else. You've just got it in your ears, it's in your earphones, it's on a speaker somewhere, and you are paying attention to nothing else. Then I'm going to have you do it as background. So while you're reading something, you've got the same piece of music going because it's acting in your ear in a totally different way. You're not listening to it with the same attention. Close listening involves being able to drill into a level of detail and listen to the way a piece is delivered orally, and then being able to pull back. And in the third week, when I actually give you the score to look at and then listen to the piece of music, you're going to see, oh, that was only three violas in that part. And, oh, that was a bassoon instead of a bass clarinet. It's going to fill out the picture for you a little bit more. Now, this is a, this is a conducting studio example that you can spin forward into any area of study. But close listening is the repeated listening of something that becomes familiar then to you in that performance, predictable. And then after it's familiar and predictable, you can start listening to a level of detail so that it's just that attack that you're listening to. It's just that color of the low brass that you're listening to. I, uh, very, very early on in my life, I was probably nine uh, when I heard a recording of the Philly Orchestra with Stokowski, really, really old recording, of the Ponchielli, Dance of the Hours. And I had it because it was on a, a record that accompanied Fantasia, the movie, the first one. And for the longest time, I could not figure out where this particular counter melody came from. It sounded like somebody speaking like this. And then I thought, maybe that's like a synthesizer or a bassoon and a trombone. It was the cello section, but it was a recording made in the late twenties, early thirties when electronic or electric microphones were new and anything that sounded in that range where the, the middle and the low partials kind of sounded like that. That's how that sounded to me. And so I learned this piece when very young with this hugely dark, chocolate kind of Moog synthesizer uh, sound coming from Chelly and bass. And the very first time I ever, ever heard Sibelius Symphony 5 and Symphony 6, I went, that sounds like that Stokowski recording. Because he was manipulating sound to be that sort of kind of a sound. Now I was in the room. This wasn't a recording. I was listening to Chelly and bass making this otherworldly sound. 
But the reason that I identified it so quickly is because of the result of close listening. I was so acquainted with how that particular sound sat in my ear in the context of the rest of this piece that when I heard it again, decades later, I had this very visceral reaction to it. Like, that's a cool sound. How do I make that sound? And where did it come from? If, if I were to um, send you to a museum to do either a close reading of something or a close visual inspection of something, I would ask you to take tiny little pieces, like two sentences of a particular Shakespeare quote and ask about what those words mean word to word and then what the context is and then what the scene is and then what the play is. If I put you in front of a piece of sculpture, I would ask you to concentrate on the back of somebody's hand and what that little curve looks like and then how that curve meets the forearm and then how that arm addresses the body. So close listening, close reading, close visual inspection. Every music ed major, by the way, listening into this knows that a visual diagnostic of a bow arm or an embouchure or the grip of a pair of, of snare sticks is part of what you train for. The ability to visually discriminate between, yeah, that'll work, and they're holding it in the wrong hand, or there's stress in the second and third finger or whatever. Uh, close listening is just a mirror of that kind of inspection. You are allowing your ear to inspect the sounds that are going into it because you know those sounds really, really well. How does this rate, uh, you, you know, we talked about uh, self-awareness, like how does that kind of lead in? I mean, those, those seem to go hand in hand, but. They absolutely do. It's a difficult, for, for me, difficult than it sounds. Say again? I said it's more difficult than it sounds. Maybe like the fact that we have better technology now is a little helpful in that way. It is a little helpful. It's also terrifying. It's terrifying. Um, I agree. I didn't know. I think about all the mistakes I've made. Now people have cameras and stuff. It freaks me out a little bit. <laughs> yeah. For instance, we're going out over Facebook now and it could be recorded across and the world. <laughs> <laughs> it'll, it'll come back to haunt us someday. That's right. The, um, I have to go back to, as far as turning that back into oneself, you have to remember the courage, the attention, and the patience necessary to maintain that as an internal skill. I, I am a big believer and advocate of the maintenance of self-patience. Uh, the, the first person you are ever going to lose patience with is going to be yourself. Whether or not you do that often enough to turn that out onto other people and get, you know, known as somebody with a really, really short temper, it's probably because you have a really short temper with yourself. Um, the cultivation of patience is one of the keys to being a really good musician. And I don't mean for that to sound like you should be lazy in any way. Being patient is being able to cut off a visceral negative reaction in favor of a constructive reaction. If you're making the same mistake, six different times in a practice session, and you're really pissed off now, rather than making the, state, the mistake a seventh time and getting even madder, do something else. Move your attention to another aspect. Maybe it's of the same passage that you're playing. Um, maybe it's uh, the way that you're holding the stick or the bow. I, the, the best example that I can give you that jumps to mind right now is the first cadenza in the first Weber clarinet concerto. I was standing there in my lesson with Dr. John Moeller at the University of Michigan, and I was gonna get this thing right. I was, it was gonna, it was, if it killed me, I was gonna get this thing right. And by the time I started the cadenza the third time and it wasn't going well, Dr. Moeller, who was standing to my right, just tapped me on the shoulder and I stopped playing. And he got really close to my face, like really up in here. And he said, whatever you do, never buy a Yugo. The tires are too small. And I looked at this man like he had just had a stroke. I thought, what? I, oh, oh okay. For those of you uh, younger than 40, uh, a Yugo 
was a very cheap, tiny car. It was like Czechoslovakian it was essentially car made, or something, right? It was like something like a Czechoslovakian car. Or something. Yes, it's it's or or a Lada from from Russia. It was it was put together with spit and hay and popsicle sticks, um, but sold for you know twenty five hundred dollars in the United States. It was this big. It was really really tiny, and the commercials were funny, and it was a, a social meme for a while. But he got really close to my nose. He said, "Whatever you do, don't buy a Yugo." the tires are too small and the entire world stopped there for a moment as i wondered what in god's name this teacher was trying to do and he he said okay and i said okay and then i started the cadenza and it went perfectly because my attention had been diverted somewhere else long enough for me not to get hung up on the same mistake and it was that it was a tiny little articulation error at the top that just messed up the whole thing that went away because my attention was diverted elsewhere now john moeller was a master teacher he had a very dry sense of humor he was an excellent mumbler if you listened carefully you guffawed at least twice in a lesson i mean he just he was a master at that kind of thing but you have to be good at doing that on your own to divert your attention away from a negative result. All of us have limits to our tempers and to how we deal with the world, especially now because we're all at home and we can't go out. Um, but to cultivate the patience necessary to stay in something long enough is the ability to head off in favor of a positive, a negative reaction. And it can be anything. It can be humor. It can be just taking a, taking a step back and going, right. And then going back to it. Didn't even have to think of anything in particular. You just had to break that very tight communication loop of you and trying to do the thing you're trying to do. So my, my answer to that is an internalization of patience and a positive outcome. And if you can spin that forward, to other people, you're going to be a phenomenally good teacher. That sounds like a that sounds like a, a good uh, a good resting point. Actually, that's, a, that's some great words to live by. Um, I want to thank uh, Mark Powell for coming in and having this conversation with us. Um, we're going to be continuing. These it has been a pleasure. Classes. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. We're going to continue these classes. I'd like to do it with all the faculty. I like, I like part of it for me because it's kind of like a get to know you. I think, um, you know, as a chair, like I, I'd love to see our school, um, you know, be a center of culture, you know, in that way. And it's good to, good to get to know the artists. We have such an amazing array of artists like yourself in our building. So uh, thank you. It's very people kind. know that Mark does a great series before concerts. And yes, we're going to have some kind of concert. So um, maybe Jane yes, or Robin, if there's any kind of like, uh, you could put our website up on the um, chat just for people yeah. to peruse where the calendar will be. And, I'm sh and we're, we're going to hold um, some of our concerts. Of course, they won't be full orchestra concerts, but I'm sure Mark would come up and do his pre-concert talk about some of the pieces or during the pieces. And um, we hope you enjoy that. Next week, we have uh, one of our um, uh, theory slash ex-chair slash composition faculty, Ed Smaltone, who's gonna, um, who's gonna talk, this, this might be more of uh, uh, for theory students who, are curious about pop music and voice leading and classical, well, like how our world relates to, to other musics, let's say, other more popular music, you know, uh, in the, on the radio and stuff. So um, I hope you join us for that. Mark, thank you so much. It was thank you. to speak to you. Appreciate and, it. Um, thank you everybody for being there. I really appreciate it. Everybody appreciate coming. Have a good day, everybody. Thanks. Bye. Bye.